Where's yours? All right. Thanks for having us here. We got a crew from INHD. We got Sabrina and Liz and Taylor and Laura are all, all on here. And Z, if you wouldn't mind watching the chat box for questions for us and just interrupt me if you see some questions flowing through there. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so here we go. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the NEC report. I'm going to go through a refresher on all the hazard layers. And then we're going to spend in the middle of the presentation, we're going to spend a lot of time on the new assembly bill 38 and what it means, how it impacts you, the new car forms. So we'll go through those. Um, but a lot of, ref you know, I like to start with some refresher items. And one of the questions I get asked all the time, you know, that having done this for over 20 years is, you know, are these hazard layers prevalent throughout California? And so Basically, the first slide shows 83% of the state is in some sort of earthquake, flood, or fire zone. So, you know, this is, I, I call it the price to pay, you pay to live in paradise, you know. So it's just something that we live with here in California, and more specifically to the fire zones. Um, you can see such a large percentage of the state is, up, is in these high fire or very high fire hazard zones. And there's been so many fires recently as we've get, gotten warmer. Uh, this trend is going to continue, uh, and the new laws are specifically uh, been put in place to kind of force us to protect ourselves, and I'll go through that in, in a little more detail. Um, and again, refresher, uh, this is a sale-only industry. The NAC reports are required on all sale transactions. Um, there are no exclusions. Um, commercial, industrial, even vacant land uh, requires an NAC report to close escrow. Um, and what we say, and this will be a recurring theme, I always say, you know, especially if you're doing business with us, when if you're a listing agent, uh, order the report when as soon as you get a listing, um, there's never a charge to you, the agent. We only get paid uh, out of the proceeds of the seller. We're a HUD item, so we only get paid when escrow closes. So if you're a listing agent, order the report immediately so you have all this information at your fingertips, especially with the new uh, AB 38 uh, rules in place. All right, so let's get into the hazard layers themselves. The first one is what we call a special flood hazard zone. I've kind of spread the maps out because your offices are throughout Southern California. So here's a map of the you know 91 corridor from Corona, you know, out through into Orange County. And the blue shaded areas are what we call the special flood hazard zone. So we have to map if any of the blue shaded areas touch the, the subject parcel. So these all these uh, determinations are based on any of these hazard layers touching the parcel. Um, so you can see the blue shaded areas are fairly prevalent. Um, and a lot of them deal with runoff areas and where water runs, you know, in, in this area, you know, it's dry for, for many, many months and then it rains for two or three straight days and we get flash flooding and that runoff uh, is typically where you're gonna, you're gonna find these special flood hazard zones, all right? And this slide just depicts just how specific we can be, because one of the questions I get from a lot of agents is, you know, my property is in a flood zone, but the person on the other side of the street is not in a flood zone. How is that possible? And it's because we're very specific with these satellite images we get from FEMA. So this, this image shows you that, you know, literally the flood zone can affect one property on a block, but, you know, the other properties across the street or down the street can, you know, are not necessarily in the flood zone. So that's how specific we have to be with our flood determinations. And so the question of the day, if the property is in the special flood hazard zone, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? Let's say you're representing a buyer. What does that mean to that buyer potentially purchasing a property? Well, if they need a mortgage to close escrow, the uh, lender is going to require insurance on the property. The, the lender's uh, work with the insurance companies. The insurance companies all know the properties that are in these flood zones, and they're going to require additional flood insurance be purchased on the property. So what I tell uh, agents all the time, whenever you're working with a buyer that's interested in a property in a flood zone, have them contact their insurance company as early in the transaction as possible so they can determine the insurance requirements and what the premiums will be. So they, it, it can help with their budgeting process so they know what the insurance premiums are gonna be as early in the transaction as possible. So that's the first of the, of the flood zones. 
Second flood zone is what we call an area of potential flooding. And this is staying with that 91 corridor area because specifically uh, this blue shaded area is a result of if the Prado Dam were to breach, those of you who live along the 91 corridor, you know, towards Eastern Orange County or into Riverside County, um, the Prado Dam is right along the 91 freeway. And we have to map when these dams are full and if the dam were to disappear, we have to map where all that water would run. And so the shaded areas are, you know, the area of potential flooding if these if the dams were to breach. Uh, and, and again, so we map the parcel in comparison to these this flood zone to see if property is, is in or out. Again, here's a very close up of uh, a dam inundation zone or an area of potential flooding. So you can see how it's very specific to properties. One property on a block can be in the zone, the property next door can be out of the zone. And that's just how specific these maps are that we look at, all right? Again, the impact to an area of potential flooding, um, you're representing a buyer, they, they may be required to purchase flood insurance on the second flood zone. Uh, flood zones, you know, th these two flood zones vary a little bit, the area of potential flooding you may be required, so again, Anytime you're dealing with a property in a flood zone, have your buyer contact their insurance company to specifically find out the insurance requirements and premiums, all right? That's the impact of being in a flood zone. It equates to the potential for more insurance, i.e. flood insurance, okay? Can I just chime in here that I look at a lot, a lot of NHDs these days and we sell a lot of properties in potential flooding areas. So make sure you're looking. Yeah, these flood zones, these area of potential flooding, these dams exist throughout California and they're not typical, like whenever you think of a dam, we think of the Hoover Dam, like you can see it, it's this huge concrete structure with a lot of water behind it. But in a lot of cases, it's just berms up, berms of dirt used to hold potable water for irrigation because we have to water everything to keep it green. So they do exist throughout the state. Okay. Let's move into the seismic zones. I'm going to skip over the fire zones and save them for last since we're going to go to AB38. So here's a Long Beach map. All right. So th this is moving down to Long Beach. The brown shaded lines are the fault zones that run through the city. There's actually a fault that runs kind of parallel to PCH all the way down into Newport from Long Beach. Um, so we have to map the active faults throughout the state, right? And the state of California considers a fault active if it's ruptured within the last 11,000 years, just to give you an idea, put in perspective how old the earth is. So they consider 11,000 years active. But anyhow, we map whether the properties touch these active fault zones or not. And then there's two other seismic zones that we have to look at. We have to look at the landslide areas and so this is moving up to uh, LA County. This is kind of the general Pasadena area and north. Um, and so you can see the, the shaded areas are the landslide zones. And as you would expect, landslide zones are typically hillsides or properties at the base of hillsides because we have to map the properties that are subject to the potential for that, uh, that soil on a hillside falling loose when the shaking from an earthquake occurs. So we map all those areas uh, in perspective to the subject properties. Then the last of the seismic zones is what we call liquefaction. Again, staying with that same general area, liquefaction areas are typically the, in the valleys, right? In the base of valleys where we're building on compacted soils and liquefaction is where uh, a solid substance like a compacted soil starts taking the shape of more like a liquid when the ground starts shaking. Um, and so the soil underneath the foundation can settle unevenly. And so we have to map these areas out, okay? So that's liquefaction. Um, why so is it liquefaction? Why is it compacted? I don't understand that. <clears throat> so soils compact and settle at the base in the valley areas, right? So soil rolls down a hill after it rains and it settles in the valley, right? And then when, um, over time, that soil just compacts. It's just what happens, you know, through gravity and, 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 and such. And so these soils, um, you know, there's not a lot, there's no bedrock directly underneath them, right? As opposed to building on the side of a mountain where you're building kind of on a hillside, which is bedrock. So because you're building, and, and by the way, they get more prevalent as you move closer to the coast. When you get into coastal areas, 
like Steel Beach, like Huntington Beach, Long Beach, down into Newport, majority of these cities are all in liquefaction areas because you're building on compacted sands. That's what's underneath you, okay? And so we have to map these zones because you have the potential of settling like during an earthquake, all right? Make sense? All right, so what's the Yes, impact? that makes sense, thank you. Thank you for, and, and just keep in asking questions, fire away. Um, so the impact, here's the good news for the impact to these uh, seismic zones, active fault, landslide, and liquefaction. There's no impact to a resale transaction, right? You've got an existing house on an existing property, a resale, no impact because the state of California realizes they can't force every structure in California to be retrofitted to current seismic codes, all right? But the impact will be if you're working with a buyer that's looking to buy vacant land and build or probably more common, you're working with a flipper that wants to do a tear down and a rebuild, building in these uh, seismic zones to current codes is gonna be stricter and more expensive, all right? Does that make sense? So new construction is gonna be impacted by these, these seismic zones. So what I tell agents is, if you have a client that's looking to do a tear down and rebuild, have them contact the city offices, find out about the current construction codes as early as they can, so they know how restrictive they are, exactly what they need to do to build in these areas. And in some cases, cities will not allow you to build in active fault zones any longer. So again, always steer your client in any of these seismic zones. If you know your client is looking to construct, steer them to the city, let them find out what the current codes are, okay? All right, so now we're going to circle back into the fire zones. And so uh, I have a number of fire maps. And so what we're looking at now, based on the new AB 38 laws, if we have to map now the high and very high fire severity zones, not just on a state level, not just from Cal Fire, but now we also have to look at the local fire maps that come from the counties and from the cities. All right, because AB 38 says now you have to look at the local maps as well. So again, here's a map of the general area. You know, this is LA County kind of through the Pasadena area. And then this next map, here's the Orange County area, all right? So you can see all the high and very high fire hazard zones, right? And these zones are all mapped based on the percentage of naturally occurring combustible materials per square mile. So you're gonna find these zones in the grassy areas as you get towards Laguna, further south as you get east towards Foothill Ranch and up into the, you know, kind of the foothill areas towards Saddleback Mountain, you're going to find these high fire hazard zones. I lived in Lake Forest for 22 years, so I know this area very well, right? And so, and that's, you know, that's where the recent fires have been too, right? Up and over Saddleback and into the, you know, the toll road corridors and such. And then we also have to look at the local map. So the next slide, this is an interesting map because the city of Irvine in their fire map simply takes the state map and adds a 100 foot buffer completely around that map. And so if you're just looking at or working with an NHD company that only has the state map, they're gonna exclude that 100 foot buffer and all those homes are not gonna be considered in the fire zone when they're looking at making their determinations, all right? So these maps are very detailed on a local level. Um, here's the Pasadena fire map, right? It's very specific to the city of Pasadena and where the fire zones exist. So we look at all these maps to make our determinations. All right. So here's the key. All right. When you look, and this happens to be an LA County property. Okay. When you look at the, the, the left portion and the, the parcel is in the yellow circle, on a state level, this property is not considered in a higher, very high fire severity zone. So if you're working with an NHD company that's only looking at the state level maps and hasn't you know, invested the money in the county and city level maps, they're going to say that property is not in the state level fire zone, i.e. not affected by AB 38. OK, here's the segue into the new laws. On the right, you see the county of L.A. fire map where clearly this property on a county level is in the fire zone. So now with AB 38, you have to consider that property as in with regards to higher, very high fire hazard, and it's now affects the property with regards to these new disclosures, okay? So what do these indeterminations mean again? Uh, first of all, uh, it may be difficult for buyers to obtain uh, 
insurance in these areas, all right? We're gonna talk about AB 38, but also there's insurance impacts to being in fire zones, all right? And insurance is typically expensive. Um, again, anytime you're dealing with a fire zone, have your buyers contact your insurance companies to find out the, you know, the, 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 the premiums for that area. And if they, have a ver if they have a difficult time getting fire insurance, you can go to the California Fair Plan, F-A-I-R, uh, uh, to get fire insurance on the property. I happen to live at the base of the Sequoia National Forest. I am in a very high fire hazard zone. We had to, and I, I've been a farmer's client for 30 years. And when we bought this property three years ago, I had to go to the California Fair Plan to get fire insurance. And it's more than twice as much as my standard property casualty policy, just to put that in perspective, okay? So, new assembly bill 38, what does it mean now? All right, first of all, there's two pieces to this. One, the first part was effective January 1st, and that basically says that it's, it's it supplements the existing high and very high fire hazard zones within state responsibility areas, right? So they're now looking at these fire maps in a different way. And in effective July 1st, you now have to be concerned about something called defensible space, all right? And I'm gonna talk about that. But what it means is now both the state and local level high and very high fire severity zones must be disclosed, right? So the local level is the new piece of this, having to look at the local fire maps. The new home hardening and defensible law does not appear on the NHC signature page. So I'll show you that page too. So the the form that has to be signed in an NHD report, that first page, Sacramento did not let anyone alter it. So there's no reference to AB 38, but I'll show you where we, uh, we make that determination for you. And here's another key. It affects the sellers of older properties. So pre-January 1 of 2010, all right? So that's one of the triggers here for these new disclosures. So if the property is in the higher, very high fire severity zone, and it was built prior to January 1st of 2010, you now are responsible for these additional disclosures and the new car form to, to take care of that for you. Uh, the construction codes changed effective January 1 of 2010 to force these retrofits on new construction going forward. So that's why we're dealing with older homes in these fire zones. And again, there's a new car form for this. There was a car form HHDA that was uh, effective January 1st. That's being replaced by car form FHDS uh, effective with closings July 1st and after. And I'll show you both forms in a second, All right? So let's look at the NHD report. Here's the natural hazard disclosure statement. This is mandatory on every NHD report, regardless of who you get it from. And as you can see, circled in red on a state level, this form only shows the state level determinations, this property is not in a high fire hazard zone. It's not in a wildland fire area, right? It clearly says no here. And this is the page that's signed. Now, the next page in our report is our natural hazard disclosure report summary. Again, at the top, you see the state level determinations. In the middle, you see where we not only have the local determinations, but we now have a supplemental fire hazard severity zone AB38, we specifically spell out AB38 on our form. And in this case, because the property is in a local fire zone, yes to AB38, which means it qualifies for the AB38 disclosures, okay? So you have to not only look at the signature page, you have to go to the next page on the report and you have to look, does this property qualify for AB38? We will tell you yes or no, okay? So once you see it, you're a listing agent, you order the report for your new listing, congratulations. You get the report, you go to this disclosure report summary page, you see yes to AB 38. Your next cause of action is when was the, when was the, the home built? It was built prior to 1-1 of 2010. Okay, I have to provide these new AB 38 disclosures, all right? And again, the next page, this is just our city county level disclosures with an explanation. So here we say, yes, the property is located in a supplemental fire zone, very high fire zone. And we, we, we give you a definition of that fire zone, um, including you know, the home fire hardening disclosure and advisory right in the, the, the guts of our report. So we're spelling this out for you. So you know immediately by looking at our report if the property qualifies for AB 38. Okay, so let's summarize effective 1-1 of 2021 and going forward. 
Um, if the property was, and these are for residential properties, one to four units, if the property was built prior to 1-1 one, one of 2010, and the property was is in a higher, very high fire hazard severity zone, then you have to provide the following statement, by the way, which is on the car form, but I like to spell out the statement here. This home is located in a higher, very high fire hazard severity zone. And this home was built before the implementation of the wildfire urban interface building codes. Those are the codes that changed 1-1 one, one of 2010, which helped to fire harden a home. This is all about making a home more defensible against flying embers during a fire, all right? It's to better protect your home from wildfire. You might need to consider improvements, information on fire hardening, including current building standards, and information on minimum annual vegetation management standards to protect homes from wildfire can be obtained on the internet website, www.readyforwildfire.org, okay? And this is right on the car form as well. But I, I recommend you all go to readyforwildfire.org because it really goes into detail about the need for fire hardening. And also it goes into the defensible space requirements as well, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Scott, Cindy yeah. has a really great question. Um, do all NHD companies have to provide the local disclosures? It's not mandatory by law, all right? The, 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 the NHD laws state that the state level disclosures are mandatory this is why you really want, this is like a buyer beware. It's a great question, buyer beware. If you're using my NHD, fantastic, thank you. You know you're gonna get the local disclosures and we're gonna spell out for you whether you are required to provide the AB 38 disclosures, right? Right on our summary page. If you're not using us, ask your provider, do you have the local fire maps? Do you have them, all right? I wanna see the local fire maps on my property. Um, because they're not all doing it and the law does not force them to, right? The law, AB 38, forces you to make sure you're paying attention to the local maps. It doesn't force the NHD company to use them. It's a fantastic question. Okay. Um, let's talk about the fire hardening pieces. This, these are the fire hardening items that are right on the car form FHDS that you have to pay attention to, right? And so if the property was, it was built prior to 1-1 of 2010, um, you have to disclose whether or not the property was retrofitted to the following items. If it was retrofitted, you don't have to check these boxes. If it was not, you have to check these boxes. And like, I think, look at, look at B, for example, this is an obvious one. Is the roof made of an untreated wood shingle or shake, right? And if it is, right, you have to check off, uh, you know, box number B on the form, right? So these are items that were not done to fire harden the home, all right? It's very specific. Um, when we bought our home in Lake Forest, 2001, it had a wooden shake roof. And so we were basically forced and the insurance companies kind of forced us to replace our wooden roof with a non-combustible material because where we were in Lake Forest, we were in a high fire hazard zone, all right? So, you know, these things, um, are being treated very seriously now because if an amber falls on a wooden roof, it, it really has got a much higher probability of catching fire and burning the home down, okay? So again, you're looking at eaves, soffits, roof ventilation where the vents have large openings because ambers can fly into them. What's the roof made of? Is the landscape within five feet of a home combustible? Um, single pane glass is not as protective against the fire as, as multiple pane glass. Loose or missing bird stoppings or flashings can be an issue and rain gutters without metal or combustible gutter covers. If your gutters are full of leaves right, and an amber falls in the gutter, it can ignite, right? So that's what all this is about. So again, you gotta work with your seller. This is for seller's agents. You gotta work with your seller to find out if any of these retrofits have been done or not, okay? And then check off accordingly. Now, effective July 1st, so coming up, is the new um, piece of this dealing with defensible space, all right? So basically, defensible space is creating space around a home, around a home where you're eliminating combustible materials that can connect a fire from something that's burning to your home. So for example, I just got done with a week's worth of weed whacking where I had to cut down, I have two acres of property, I had to cut down all the, the, the grass and grassy areas down below four inches within a hundred feet of my house, right? 
how to knock that all down so there wasn't a bunch of high grass that dries out in the summertime and could ignite real easily, right? Just as an example, um, you have to space your plants and shrubs on your property, right? You can't have combustible materials within 30 feet. So if you have a wood burning stove, you can't have a wood pile within 30 feet of your home. So these are all items that you have to, uh, like the home seller has to provide a certificate now effective July 1 to the home buyer that their property is in compliance with the defensible space laws. All right. So you can go to Cal Fire if you live very rural like I do. If you live in county or city limits, you can go to the local city to fire department. You could go to the county fire department and ask them what their specific defensible space requirements are. If you're working with a seller that's in a high or very high fire hazard severity zone. OK, by the way, defensible space does not care when the home was built. This is any home in a high or very high fire hazard severity zone. You have to provide to any potential buyer a certificate that that property was certified regarding creating defensible space. OK. So again, here's the triggers just to summarize. Home hardening triggers, right? This is these are you know for these retrofit items. These are for re residential properties. If the property was built before January 1st of 2010, and on the MyNEC report, it says, yes, AB 38, it's in a high or very high fire hazard severity zone. You have to fill out the new car form FHDS, right? With regards to defensible space, if the property is just simply in a high or very high fire hazard severity zone and is a residential property that effective with escrows closing after July 1, on July 1 or after, you have to fill out the car form FHDS regarding the defensible space portion of the form, right? Here's the old form, just so you can see it. It was a one page form, HHDA, all right? And as you can see on the form, section two, number two, you can see those items, A, B, C, D, E, and F that I just listed off on a previous slide. They're right in the, the form itself, all right? This form is now being replaced by CAR form FHDS. And again, when you look at number three, section B, you see all those fire hardening items, one, two, three, four, five, and six. When you get to item number four, there's your defensible space requirements where you have to basically, uh, as a representative of the seller, provide to a buyer the certificate that, that the property has been compliant regarding defensible space, or you can get the buyer, if, you, if the buyer is used to living in a wooded area, right? Then they may say, you know what, I'll take on that responsibility. I understand defensible space and I'll do it. So it's kind of an either or proposition, all right? And this new form is a two page form with the, you know, the signatures required on the second page, okay? All right. So again, summarizing, uh, you know, the high, very high fire hazard property is in, we're gonna tell you that in our summer page, you have to disclose where home hardening is not taking place. That's form FHDS for that purpose. You also must educate buyers about creating defensible space and provide the certification. And there's a website from Cal Fire, readyforwildfire.org that can help you with all the details on this information, okay? So that's AB 38, right? Uh, in addition though, we talked about local data, right? We talked about the importance of the local fire maps, but fire maps are not the only maps, only local maps. Uh, that, that exists. There's maps dealing with dam inundation zones. There's maps dealing with seismic zones. Uh, and again, this just I'm just proving the point that you, you want to work with an NHD company that has all this local information. The local seismic zones and flood zones can clearly affect new construction, right? It can affect items like new construction. And in certain cases, like uh, Riverside County, for example, has not even been mapped yet on a state level for liquefaction and landslide zones, right? But the county of Riverside has liquefaction and landslide zones. So you really need this local information in your NHD report, right? When you're providing it to any potential buyer for your protection, right? As well as protecting your clients. Okay. Scott, what if someone is uh, remodeling? Is that um, something that they check need to check with the city about? Or just, are they already grandfathered in? So the, the remodel, it, it's a great question. You're dealing with permitting now, right? With regards to a remodel. So if you're just 
you know, doing some some painting and trim work and those types of things, I, you know, seriously doubt you're going to require permits. But if you're doing some serious construction, you really got to work with the city to understand whether you need permits or not. So it's a great question. Um, so yeah, anytime you're doing any kind of construction, check with check with your city offices for sure. All right, so I'm just showing you some examples of local maps. Here's a Long Beach flood map. This is specific to the city of Long Beach. All right, so they have their own specific flood map, which differs from the state map. Here's an LA County flood and dam map. This is in the Pasadena area, right? Um, here's the Pasadena dam map itself. So this is different than the state level dam map. So as you can see, we, we have all the county maps, we have all the city maps incorporated into our product for your protection, right? I just wanna pound that point home. All right, so that's all the hazard layers, right? That's all the flood, fire, seismic zones that, that we have to pay attention to in the report. In addition, there's two mandatory tax disclosures that are required. One is what we call Melarus, right? The Melarus bonds were created years ago to, for land developers to defray the cost of required infrastructure when they're, when they're building out real estate, right? Um, so in, in a, you know, besides building the homes, developers used to have to pay for the roads, sewers, parks, schools, et cetera. Now they defray those costs onto the home buyers through these Melarus bonds. So we have to specifically tell you whether the property is or is not affected by them. We have a separate page just for that purpose in our report. We also have to tell you if the property is affected by 1915 bonds. These are more traditional bonds uh, that were uh, created years ago um, to help landowners defray the cost of required utilities, right? So years ago, farmers had to run power, water, even land phone lines to their properties. They got together with adjacent property owners uh, to def help defray the cost by creating these bonds. And over time, as the farmland was zoned, it was uh, sold and rezoned and subdivided, uh, you know, the, the percentage of ownership of these bonds was assessed and passed on to the new property buyers and owners. Uh, so again, here we have a separate page. In this case, the property is affected by a 1915 bond and we'll tell you what the current levy is and even the expiration date. Good news for this, uh, this property, the bond's expiring in 2021, okay? And in addition, in our, in our report, we provide a, 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 a comprehensive tax roll. At the time you order the report, we uh, get the information, the current information based on that time period uh, from the county treasury department. So um, it's great information to have. Again, you're a listing agent, you're holding an open house, right? This, you know, the next two questions after the price is what are the taxes, where are the schools? So if you have the NHD report, you have a good summary of the current tax roll. So it's gonna, you know, they change year over year, but they don't change drastically. So it's a, it's a good item to provide to a potential buyer when they're trying to do their budgeting in their head and they're looking at your property, okay? Scott, we have another great question before we move on. Okay. Um, and it's going back to the very high hazard severity zone um, from Oscar. Um, what about a home that is in a very high um, fire hazard zone, but it's in a normal neighborhood such as Wrightwood, is that rural, I guess, and they cannot create a defensible zone due to neighbors? So that's a great question. The defensible zone, uh, defensible space, there's two zones. There's a 30 foot zone around the property. That's where you can't have combustible materials like wood piles and you can't have combustible plants around your home. Uh, tree limbs can't be touching your home. And then out to a hundred feet, you have to space your shrubs and trees and you have to cut all your grass down to four inches. It's 30 feet or a hundred feet or to your property boundary, okay? So for example, on three sides of my property, I go out to 100 feet. On the fourth side, after 40 feet is the Sequoia National Forest. So I only have to clear up to my property boundary. You don't go past your property boundary to clear and create defensible space. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's up to 30 feet for boundary one or your property line and up to 100 feet for boundary two or your property line, all right? So great question. Okay, 
Moving along, um, everything we talked about so far is in what we call our standard report, right? If you want all the environmental disclosures, they're in our premium report. So the environmental information, this provides information about a property's proximity to known environmental sites. So different than the hazard layers, we, we tell you the property is touching the hazard layer, it's in or not in. We tell you a proximity, we give you a proximity report on the environmental disclosures. We tell you how close these items can be to the subject property, right? Uh, all this information is found in public databases, right? Um, it's detailed, so all buyers, you know, will know the environmental sites in the area. And again, I always say more is better with disclosures, so it's more protection for you, the agent. The more you provide, the more disclosure information you provide, the better you're protected with regards to that transaction. And here's, uh, so circling back to Long Beach area, here's the environmental sites in Long Beach. Now this is a, you know, this is a large radius map of the entire city. Um, the majority of the environmental sites that we look at are the Blue Crosses, which are leaking underground storage tanks, right? So these are oil rigs, the, the storage tanks underneath oil rigs, or these are gas stations where their tanks are leaking, right? They, they, once they're leaking, the, the government, whether it's the state or federal government, comes in to remediate that site, to clean it up. And then once they're working on cleaning up the site, it goes on the database that we pick up and we put it in the report, all right? The green dots, these are uh, hazard waste sites. These are dump sites, right? So this is the city, county, or even private dump sites where hazardous waste could be dumped, okay? This could be something as simple as a, you know, a, a place that sells tires that can legally dump tires in their, in their back area of their lot, right? But anything, any, any property where uh, toxic materials can be dumped legally, they go on a database, we pick it up and put it on the dump site. And then we also will list the oil rigs, you know, and those sites, and then any other site that um, if, if an industry like a paint manufacturer needs to use a toxic chemical in the manufacturing of their uh, product, they have to be registered on a site, what's called a surplus site, because they're using uh, a toxic material in their manufacturing. So we pick that up uh, on the database and put it in our report. So um, all these sites go in this environmental piece. And don't be, you know, don't be nervous looking at this. This is the entire city of Long Beach. And typically, more densely populated areas have more environmental sites on them. When we're looking at a subject property, we're looking at a half mile radius. So it's a very small circle around the property to see how close any of these sites are. And then we simply list how close these sites are to the property, okay? Any questions there? All right. So, no questions. Go ahead, question or no? No? No. Okay. Uh, so summarize, you know, just, just, just some summary information. All right, we carry $10 million of, you know, insurance from Farmers California. You know, I always tell uh, agents, always check with your NEC company to make sure they have a current, you know, certificate. That's what protects you. We've never had a claim, you know, against our product. We, you know, we've never had an incorrect determination, but they've happened with other companies. So it's the e and insurance that protects you if that were ever to occur. So always check and make sure, remember we talked about the fact that we're paid through escrow. Also no charge for canceled orders, right? So if your escrow cancels, that's okay. When a new escrow opens up, if it's a month later, right? Order a new report. There's no, there's no additional charge. There's never a charge to you, the agent, right? Especially now that you're supposed to order in a tight time frame. The moment you get a listing, order your NHC report from us, right? You're, there's never gonna be a charge to you regardless of, of whether the escrow you know, can't, uh, opens or cancels, right? Um, you see our pricing on there. We think our pricing is excellent. Um, and we have 24 hour ordering and product delivery. That's another thing you should expect from your NHD company. You could go to our website. It's Friday night, six o'clock. You're, you're having dinner um, or a beer like I like to have Friday at six, right? Oh crap, I have an open house tomorrow. I wish I had my NHD report. Just go online with us and order it. You'll have it within an hour, right? We're 24 seven. So um, make sure your company can provide you that level of service and support, okay? And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just see what other questions or uh, anything we want to go back to and, and cover again. So I'll open it up to the group. 
I have a question. I have a, oh, go ahead. I have, I had a situation before where it's in the city of Azusa. The NHD report that you guys gave said that it has an underground gas, you know, if a buyer asks that question, obviously we can't explain it. How is that, I mean, how does that affect as a buyer? Would they be concerned about being on that type of property? Uh, how does that work? So it's a great question. So what I tell agents is that what we're telling you is just, you know, any, any of these sites, right, where there's been an issue, we're just providing this information to you for your reference. Now, with regards to a leaking underground storage tank, the potential is that it could contaminate groundwater, right? If something's leaking, something's right. toxic. Now, as long as your property is connected to city water, right? There's no risk to those people moving into that property, right? When you move rural, if you guys are working like, like where you are, if you move further north up into the foothills, right? Some of those properties are on well water. That becomes more significant. If there's a leaking underground storage tank, uphill from a property that's on well water, then you really want to make sure that that property buyer is having that well check to make sure it's not contaminated. Does that make sense? Got it. It's a I great see. question. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Scott, I, I one more question. I'm sorry. Question. One more question. Just a follow up question. No, sure. so sorry. On, on, they're doing a lot of landscaping right now, which are the fake grass, the turf. Would you recommend those type or do we have to disclose it? I don't know, is it com considered combustible or how does that work? So great question. I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not a horticultural specialist, right? This is what I recommend you do. First of all, if you're not in a high or very high fire hazard zone, you don't have to worry about whether the landscaping is combustible or not. If you're in that high or very high fire hazard zone, right? And you're not sure you're representing the seller and they're not sure you're representing the buyer and the buyer's asking the question, then get a landscaper involved. They will know. Okay, got it. Thank Great you. Question. Okay. So Scott, I have a transaction out in Wrightwood where I'm representing the buyer. Property has pine trees located inside the, the property itself inside the uh, the backyard, the property. So my concern is a defensible space. How far do we have to have the, the tree limbs, these pine trees from the property itself? Because we've seen the property, it has um, rain gutters on it and you know they may not be 100% free of debris. With this new law that's coming out, you know, what do I have to worry about? As, as so great question. Eight. Great question. So limbs have to be cut up to eight feet. All right. Number one. So they don't want limbs close to the ground where ground fire can catch the limbs on fire and dead branches or branches of any kind can't be touching the structure. So if that pine tree has a branch that's hanging onto the roof, then you want to remove that branch. Make, does that make sense, Oscar? Yeah. Yeah, I was more, and thank you for sharing that. And um, what about the 30 foot uh, rule that, that you were talking about? Because I mean, we have a neighbor right next door where, I mean, 30 feet, you're touching that, you actually would be touching the, you know, the, the neighbor's home. So you, it, it's 30 foot or to your property boundary, right? Like okay. I used to live in Big Bear Lake and we had neighbors that were like on one side that were closer to 30 feet. So I couldn't have my wood pile between my house and the property boundary, right? I'd have to put the, the wood pile on another side of the house where it wasn't within 30 feet, right? So it's up to 30 feet or the property boundary. Okay, got it. Wow, I think it was super informative. I have a question. Regarding the taxes, uh, special assessments and mail or rules, uh, usually we have a hard time finding the expiration date if there is one. So your report will always have it if there Correct. is one? Correct. So it, it has a separate page. Uh, I'm going to let me share my screen again real quick. All right. So hang on and I'll just back up. So the first two pages in our tax report, page one is Melrose 
is or is not affected, all right? And if it is, it would tell you, like, like in this case, the second page is the 1915 bond. It is affected. It gives you the current assessment amount, all right? And it gives you the expiration date. So it's right in our first two pages are those two specific tax disclosures. If it's in or if it is affected, then we give you the levy amount and the expiration date. Okay. So, and if there is no expiration date, it is to assume that there isn't one or that not that you, there wasn't one that you could locate. Does that make uh, sense? The Melrose, they have to have an expiration date. So we, we try, I'd say 99.5% of the time we find the expiration date, right? Okay. Um, because they have to have one. I will tell you this little, you know, Melrose bonds about three years ago, they updated the law. So now they can actually extend the Melrose bonds. So let's say you initially was a 30 year bond and you're getting, you know, you're within five years of expiration date. If the city where that property resides changes their codes, right? And the code affects, you know, the, the, the land developers then the land developer can have the bond extended. So um, we will reflect that in our report, but I just want you, you know, the audience to understand that sometimes the, now the expiration dates do actually change and get extended on these Melrose bonds. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're tricky. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, look. Uh, Speak now questions. or forever hold your peace. Yeah, great questions, and we're always available, right? You, you'll you'll have all our contact information. Uh, you know, we're available anytime. If you ever have any questions, uh, especially with the new AB thirty eight laws, um, you know, don't hesitate to ask us. We're glad to help. Oh, Scott, I, can I you do have one. Put the question. contact information in the chat box. Will. We'll right or someone from your team put your contact information in the chat box. I'm sorry, Monica, go ahead. Yeah, no, no problem. And he probably already said, and I didn't catch it, the tax information is included in the premium or the basic? All reports. All reports. Okay, thank you. Cindy, any questions that you think we should know about? No, and I, I do want you guys to know that I look at a, a lot of NHD, um, NHD reports and they are not all the same. They do not all have the same information. Some are six pages and some are, you know, 20 pages. So um, the reason that we asked my NHD to come is because their report is probably the most comprehensive of all. But, you know, make sure, take a look at your next NHD and if it's not giving you all this information, you know, let's let's uh let's look for a change. Thank you for coming. We appreciate Thank it. you for having us. We answered really all the questions I had. Um, hopefully everybody. So thank you.